Good afternoon. Well, today uh, marks my final attendance at a NATO foreign ministerial. I've spent uh, a good amount of time in this building during the past four years, and I think it was time well spent. The Alliance has made great strides, and uh, we've seen just in the past 24 hours how much uh, ground member states can cover when we uh, are working together, and it proves once again why this alliance is one of the greatest forces for security and stability in history. Uh, yesterday, at the meeting of the North, at, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Council, we uh, reached a decision to augment Turkey's uh, air defenses to protect against a threat of ballistic missiles from Syria and reinforce our commitment to Turkey's security. Uh, the United States expects to make a contribution to this essential NATO mission. At yesterday's meeting of the NATO-Russia Council, we reviewed our extensive cooperation with Russia in places like Afghanistan, and also spoke frankly about the areas of disagreement that continue to exist between NATO and Russia, including Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity and the need for a political transition in Syria. At today's meeting uh, with our non-NATO ISAF partners, we reviewed the situation on the ground in Afghanistan as the transition to 2014 continues, when the Afghan National Security Forces will have full responsibility for Afghanistan's security with the U.S. and ISAF forces in a supporting role. And we discussed the need for an efficient, transparent, accountable mechanism to channel the international community's contributions uh, to the Afghan forces. At the NATO-Georgia Commission meeting this morning, we continued our conversation with Georgia about how it can keep making progress toward NATO, especially by continuing to strengthen democratic institutions, reform. NATO-Georgia Commission meeting this morning, we continued our conversation with Georgia about how it can keep making progress toward NATO, especially by continuing to strengthen democratic institutions, reform their armed forces, and contribute to our common security. When you take a step back and consider all the uh, important issues that we covered uh, in a single ministerial meeting here at NATO, it reveals, uh, again, how critical our alliance is. After more than 60 years, it keeps us safe, it projects security and stability globally. And through our partnerships, we're able to do more in more places. For the United States, we find it extremely valuable to be able to consult closely with our European allies on challenges uh, from Syria to the Middle East to North Korea. When I think back on the past four years and all we have accomplished together, it really is quite impressive. Summits in Strasbourg, Lisbon, and Chicago that put forth very substantive outcomes. A new strategic concept to guide NATO in the 21st century. A major successful operation in Libya. A plan to protect all allies from ballistic missiles. A substantive dialogue with Russia started again after having been frozen. Chartering a course for the transition in Afghanistan, and of course, uh, enlarging the alliance to include Albania and Croatia. So the United States is grateful to NATO. We believe it's needed more than ever, and therefore we believe we all must continue to invest in it, politically, uh, financially, diplomatically, and communicate uh, to our people uh, the value that NATO brings, because these investments are worth it. And finally, on a personal note, I've been very proud to work uh, with Secretary General Rasmussen and the uh, extraordinary team here at NATO, along with my foreign ministerial colleagues, uh, and I thank all of them for the excellent uh, working relationship that we've enjoyed the past four years. We'll take three today. We'll start with AP. Brad Clapper, please. Yes, thank you. Madam Secretary, you and National Security Advisor Donilon have spoken with your, your, your Egyptian counterparts about Egypt's constitution process, uh, but you've expressed no public concern despite what some people in your administration warn as the draft's attempts to roll back the rights of women, religious minorities, freedom of speech, and the press. Um, 
Madam Secretary, what shortcomings do you see in the draft constitution, and what would be the repercussions of the constitution entering into force on the uh, democratic transition? Thank you. Well, Bradley, first let me say we have been watching very closely uh, this process as it is unfolding in Cairo with concern. We've expressed that uh, repeatedly over the last weeks uh, because almost two years ago, uh, the Egyptian people took to the streets uh, because they wanted real democratic change. And they therefore, not the Americans, not anyone else, but the Egyptian people deserve a constitution that protects the rights of all Egyptians, men and women, uh, Muslim and Christian, and ensures that Egypt will uphold all of its international obligations. Uh, they also want and deserve uh, a constitutional process that is open, transparent, and fair, and does not unduly favor one group over any other. Uh, so the upheaval we are seeing now, once again, in the streets uh, of Cairo and other cities, indicates that dialogue is urgently needed, and it needs to be a two-way dialogue, not one side talking at another side, but actual respectful exchanges of views and concerns among Egyptians themselves uh, about the uh, constitutional process and the substance of the Constitution. Um, it's also important that Egypt's courts uh, be allowed to function during this period. So we call on all stakeholders in Egypt uh, to settle their differences through democratic dialogue, and we call on Egypt's leaders to uh, ensure that the outcome uh, protects the democratic promise of the revolution for all of Egypt's citizens. Uh, ultimately, it is up to the Egyptian people to uh, chart their way forward, but we want to see a process that uh, is inclusive uh, and a dialogue that is truly uh, open to a free exchange of ideas uh, that will further the democratic uh, process in Egypt. Next will be Javid Hanim from Pajwak News Agency, Afghanistan, please. Oh, here? Here? Here. Thank you. Uh, what is the latest uh, development of negotiation about bilateral security agreement uh, with Afghanistan? and what's its impact on negotiation and reconciliation? Well, I think we are off to a, a productive start um, about the bilateral uh, security agreement. Um, it follows, as you know, on the strategic partnership agreement that we signed uh, between the United States and Afghanistan uh, last May. Um, and with the launching of the talks on a bilateral security agreement, we've had the first round of negotiations on uh, November 15th. Um, there is an agreed uh, date to uh, have the next round, uh, with the goal being to uh, conclude an agreement within uh, one year. Uh, and, 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 you know, these talks really illustrate our commitment uh, to a uh, uh, post-2014 Afghanistan that can secure itself uh, and to a political process that uh, is able to move Afghanistan further toward uh, democracy and uh, stability uh, that respects uh, the rights of all Afghans and which puts into writing uh, the uh, partnership that the United States and Afghanistan uh, enjoy. Um, we also continue to support an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned uh, reconciliation process. Ultimately, we believe there has to be uh, a political uh, resolution uh, to the uh, ongoing disputes among Afghans themselves. Uh, so the United States strongly uh, supports that and we would like to see uh, progress made. We think the two are reinforcing because we want everyone in the region to know that the United States intends to stand by uh, the people of Afghanistan, uh, and that we want to see all Afghans enter a political process, uh, lay down their arms, uh, 
absolutely denounce violence and uh, work together for the betterment of their country. Last one today will be Alexandra Mayer, DPA, Germany. Right here, Madam Secretary. Um, just to get back on the Patriot missiles, um, how worried are you that this deployment could actually intensify tensions in the region rather than calm down the situation? And is the United States ready to go further if there, um, if there are chemical weapons used inside Syria or against neighbors? Thank you. Well, first, um, I, I think it's a great tribute to uh, NATO that this uh, decision uh, to deploy uh, the Patriots was uh, taken because it's very much in line with our uh, solidarity among all of the members. Uh, this is for defensive purposes. Uh, that makes That's made absolutely clear in the, uh, the statement that was agreed upon. It is solely for the defense of Turkey. It will have no offensive or other purpose. I, I don't believe that it uh, necessarily brings any greater attention to the tragedy unfolding in Syria, uh, but it does send a clear message to the Syrians that uh, uh, Turkey has the full support of all um, uh, its NATO allies. Um, and I have to say, again, what I said on Monday, what uh, President uh, Obama has said repeatedly, um, we've made our views absolutely clear uh, to the Syrians, uh, to the international community, uh, through various channels, public, private, direct, indirect, uh, that uh, this is uh, a situation that uh, the entire international uh, community is united on. Um, and our concerns are that an increasingly desperate Assad regime uh, might turn to chemical uh, weapons or might lose control of them to one of the many groups that are now operating uh, within Syria. And so as part of the absolute unity that we all have on this issue, we have sent a, uh, an unmistakable message that uh, this would cross a red line, and those responsible would be held to account. Um, and we intend to make that view as clear as we possibly can. Now, ultimately what we should be thinking about is a political transition in Syria, uh, and one that needs to start as soon as possible. Uh, now that there is a new opposition formed, uh, we are going to be uh, doing what we can to uh, support that opposition. I'm looking forward to the Friends of the Syrian People meeting next week in uh, Marrakesh, where we will explore with like-minded countries what more we can do to try to bring this conflict to an end. Uh, but that will require uh, the Assad regime uh, making uh, the decision to uh, participate in a political transition, ending the violence against uh, its own people. Uh, and we hope that uh, they do so because we believe, as you know, that uh, their fall is inevitable. It's just a question of how many, uh, how many people will die until that date occurs. Uh, so uh, on, um, on Syria, uh, there's, uh, there's great uh, concern here at the alliance, but a great uh, solidarity in defending Turkey and sending a clear message to the Assad regime and in trying to um, work toward the day when uh, we can see the conflict uh, come to an end. Thank you all very much.